and thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. You know, like we stated, typically we like to do these things in person, but uh, given today's events, you know, we're, we're adapting and overcoming just like the rest of you. Um, you know, and like Christina stated, I've been in the industry for about 20 years. I've had uh, my fair share of different types of equipment and different manufacturing solutions from custom high-end cabinetry to standard uh, semi-custom box manufacturing. And then, you know, I, I build my own stuff here too. So personal furniture and cabinetries on a router in my garage. And then I've also ran all kinds of equipment in between. So, you know, this is a personal subject to me because I've dealt with this issue for a long time. Cabinet doors are a uh, struggle. There's a pain point in there. So let's talk about some of those things and discuss opportunities for improvement. So, you know, the first thing is, is like we talked about, there's issues in door production. There's struggles that you guys face. And we'll start with that kind of overarching discussion and then we'll move on to a solution. So first and foremost, I wanna talk about, let's set the parameters of what we're discussing. And that's the cope and stick construction, which is primarily the most common for cabinet door industry. There's mitered and other solutions, but today we're gonna to focus on that. And, and I bring up the painted side also because our industry or, or the trend in the market, you know, what's, what's on Pinterest and everything else is heavily painted. And that introduces its own complexity. Perfection is required to get that joint to look very good and, and not have additional defects. So let's start our, fo our focus. Hairline cracks is one of the big things that everybody's dealing with right day. You know, there's several reasons that it can occur. One of the big ones that I think people overlook though is machining before the glue sets. So during your clamping process, you need to look at your glue and understand some glues have a seven minute set time, some have a 30 minute set time. The big thing is, is once you've clamped it, whatever that set time is, you need to make sure before you go down to a sander or a shape and size, some type of machine that could put stress on that joint, that you allow that to have that set time so that it cures before you do any machining. After that, we start looking at tenon construction. Are my inserts lined up correctly? Um, is the tool lined up appropriately? Am I using mismatched inserts? In my own personal experience, the cabinet shop I was at, we had our inserts from our sticking were from one provider and our inserts for our cope were from another provider. And the two didn't match up. And at one point we were sharpening those inserts and then splitting them, spreading the inserts. Well, so our lines were never going to be successful. It was okay back when everything was stained because you put a little putty in it, it hides it very well. But with paint, you get that hairline crack. The next is the machining process, poor machining. Is it dull tooling? Is my operator feeding it too fast or feeding it too slow? Either of these can create a poor bond, which in turn creates this hairline crack. The last part is inaccuracy in my, in my process. If I don't have things the right length, I can create this gap naturally. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So if my rails, top and bottom rails are different sizes, let's say my top rail is 10 thousandths long and my bottom rail is 10 thousandths short. And this is realistically, even in a highly accurate cutting operation, that's a realistic opportunity because even the most accurate saws have a plus or minus of 10, maybe 15 thousandths. So let's take that two, we put it together and we match it with our styles. Now I have a trapezoid with a gap on both the top and the bottom of my rails. So I've already set myself up for failure. And that's where you see a lot of these guys in the paint area putting Bondo or putty or additional efforts to try to fill that gap when the problem was inconsistencies in length. Same thing with my styles. If they're not sized right, if they're not sized accurately, if any of those components are off a little bit, I've got an unsquare door. And now a lot of guys will go to a, a, a shape and size or a CNC, maybe it's a table saw, 
to go back and to get my square dimensions. But all I'm doing is, is I'm covering up an issue that started in the beginning with inconsistent part length. So another issue within our, our world is common is profiles, that inside profile. Typically everybody has at least two, a shaker, maybe it's a bead or an OG. But lots of times guys will have multiple profiles. For example, the semi-custom shop I was at, we had eight different inside profiles, plus we had glass bead profiles for each of those profiles. So we had a multitude of those. Now that being stated, 70% was shaker, the 20% was a bead, and then the remaining made up the remaining 10%. But I still had to have something set up to produce those parts. So one common way that we see is shapers. It's not uncommon for me to walk into a shop and see five, six, 10, maybe 15 shapers set up dedicated to a process. And that's great. Shapers do a good job. There's a lot of benefits with those. But the problem is, is when I've got that many pieces of equipment spread out through my shop, I've capitalized on a lot of floor space. And that floor space is valuable production opportunity, especially if it's for a profile that I may only run once a week. So lots of guys will have, maybe it's only a few shapers, but now I've got the setup time. And every time I make an adjustment, every time I move something, there's an opportunity for me to not make the right move. There's an opportunity for something to go wrong. And so there's that opportunity to create error, mismatches in profile. Heck, I might select the wrong profile. Either way, I have to be, if I'm the operator, I have to be qualified to make those adjustments and fine tune that shaper in the position. It also requires me to have some sort of an S4S product something that's already dimensioned ahead of time. So I've got to utilize all of that stuff to create a good product consistently. And there's a lot of opportunities for error in there. The next solution would be let's mold it. Now there's some great benefits to this. I get a really consistent product coming out of a molder, far superior to what you would get to a shaper because of the design of the mold. I'm not only putting the profile on, but I'm also dimensioning that part all at once. So I get a really tight tolerances. But I've got some cons. There again, if I don't want to do a lot of setups, I've got a massive amount of inventory. I have to have profiles for that one-off rework that's got to come back and get redone because something happened in paint shop. Somebody dropped it. The typical stories of what goes on. So I have to have an inventory. And when I have inventory of wood that's in a dimension machine, machine dimension, I take an opportunity for that to warp, twist, bow, to do the things that wood does. I had a friend of mine that once told me, it's an easy business if it wasn't for wooden people. And that's the truth. You know, as, as wood sits, it moves. And now I'm also taking the opportunity to ruin my glue joint because as it, from the time it gets machined to 24 hours, is the time I have to get a good consistent glue joint. So inventory doesn't allow for that great glue joint aspect. So then I'm stuck back with multiple setups. And I have the same issues that I have with a shaper, only it's a little easier to get back to that original adjustment on a molder. And the one thing that a lot of guys don't take into account for though is the yield loss. So, if I have S4S and I'm cutting out defects, I can take that board and flip the bow over so that the bow is in the right direction. Or if there's a knot on one side but not on the other, I can flip that part. But if those are in opposite directions when I go to mold it, I've already decided what that yield is and I've reduced my availability by having that pre-profile. And then the last part of it is I've got to figure out how to cope with a profile on there. So that means I either need to have a reverse backer block or I have to have two spindles, a counterclockwise and a clockwise so that I don't get blowout on my profile. 
So overall, what this does is we create a lot of opportunities and each opportunity is an opportunity to create re rework. And this is something that a lot of guys don't take into account, but the fact of the matter is, is your rework is costing you three times. It's the cost to build it wrong. It's the cost to build it right. And then the time lost because I'm not building something that I'm getting paid for. Plus you have all the additional costs, warranty cost out in the field, customer satisfaction. How, how quantifiable is that, right? If I get one bad door, does that make the homeowner go back through and nitpick every part of the cabinet? I know in my world, I handled warranties for a while. And as soon as one was one thing was bad, it amplified. And now we're taking in a microscope and looking at all the cabinets in a higher detail. Overall, there's all kinds of hidden costs. This is a great analogy with an iceberg. The iceberg is always bigger underneath the water, right? We, we know what our scrap rate is. We know what our, our, we can identify our warranty, but it's all the other things that we don't take into account. So how much is poor quality of door manufacturing costing you? So we've talked about the problem. Now let's start talking about some opportunities or a solution. So about two years ago, Styles introduced the kitchen cell from Vertonghen, consisting of two machines, a profiler for the sticking and a tenoner for the cope. On board with that machine, we've got a fully integrated CNC touchscreen, fully CNC positioning so that I'm not worried about manual adjustments. And when I take that opportunity of air out, and I'm not relying on the operator anymore, I get a much faster process, a simpler process, and most importantly, a more accurate process. And the great thing with this Vertonghen work cell is now we start talking about batch size one. So it's the next door and the next door and the next door. And I don't care what the profile is because I'm just going to position the machine. So let's dive a little deeper. Let's start with the tenoner. The tenoner is called the pentho. So it's a single end tenoner and we'll watch a video to see how this operates. So the pentho, it's a CNC tenoner with a saw for sizing. And then I've got a stack of tools for my cope. As you can see, we're using an outside fence to set the size so I know both parts, two pieces, are the exact same size. So I've got a match set and this is going to be the rails for my door. The next is I'm just gonna use the saw and size my styles. So everything is perfectly set to length. The software is easy to operate, simple touch screen, select the program, select my width, and I'm off to the races. Last, as you'll watch, the tenoning table speeds up during normal production and slows down upon the cutting. That way I maintain the best quality of cut possible. So just as a review, I've got an automatic table now that moves and I don't have to worry about an operator going too fast or too slow through the cutting process, ruining tools and causing issues with the glue joint. I've got a pneumatic clamp that allows me to work with two pieces at a time. So now my styles are matched and my rails are matched for the door. I've got a coping spindle that allows me to size and I can put multiple tools. And as you watch that video, the cutter head moves away while I'm sawing and then jumps in once I engage to cut the profile or to cut the cope. This gives a much better quality of cut and a longer life. So let's watch this loading and unloading. I do wanna make a note based off of this video, the new adjustments, we actually have a um, sizing part where we can type in and say that the part's an eighth inch over and that fence automatically moves into position. But look how easy this is. He just slides it up, 
gets his hands out of the way, and we're off producing a high quality product that are simple, easy, and safe. So now let's talk about the profile a little bit. So the profile is a single-sided molder. As you'll watch through the operation, so I've got an outside fence. That's, this is giving me the ability to give a consistent width. I've also have a solid rubber belt that allows me to feed short parts and maintain maximum control. On both the infeed and the outfeed, I've got a side pressure belt that allows for the part to be ejected out and enter safely and against the fence. And here I've got one door made all ready to rock and roll. So just as a quick review, side pressure belt before and after, and the next slide will have a good picture of that. And a top belt that secures the part even with short pieces and maintains control. Another key point is a steel table. So the steel table with a cutout. Let's take a look at that real quick. So on the left-hand side, you can see I've got my cutter stack and I've got a steel table that's just cut out so that I've got minimal opportunity for my part to vary. A lot of other solutions out on the market use more like a edge bander product where I've got belt top and bottom. With that belt top and bottom, my part, my part is extending out so that I don't have a collision with the belt and the tool. But that means that while I'm cutting, I don't maintain the maximum control. Versus here with the Vertongen and the steel table, I can maintain maximum control both on the outfeed and the infeed. That allows for a very tight tolerance and short parts. And then you can see on the right, on the infeed, there's a belt that helps keep it up against the fence in the feeding direction. Same thing on the outfeed. So we're maintaining control and most importantly, keeping your operator, you or whoever that may be, safe from cutter heads and pinch points. So let's talk a little bit about sizes. Four inches is the minimum length. Now, I don't know about you, but that takes care of 99% of all of the parts. So I can do both pieces up to inch and a half. And my operator stays out of the way and is completely safe. Also, I can do parts up to 100 inches long just with a touch of the screen. This allows for all aspects of what you need in a set of kitchen cabinet doors. Then on the width, we can do up to nine inches, two inch and a half, capturing the remaining part of most cabinet door construction. Outside of that, if I need something longer, I can still use the tenoner. I just don't have the stop. But this really captures 90%, 99% of everything that most guys are producing. So a recap, minimum of four inches, maximum of 100 inches on the tenoner for length. And I can size parts inch and a half to nine inches on the profile. So now with the software, Changing links, changing profiles is just as simple as a stroke of a few buttons. I'm able to do 300 millimeters on my spindle height, which gives me about nine profiles that I can operate. So now my setup time is minimal. I can have all of my parts ran by a single operator, all of my profiles on board the machine. I can do a changeover in less than 20 seconds. So this is how we get a batch size one. So like we talked about, 300 millimeter stool, tool height gives us nine tools. I've also got quick change nut on the top so I can swap tools in and out for those that maybe have more than the nine tools or require more than that. I've got single operator cell, 20 second changeover, batch size one. And if that's not enough, 
we also have the option of adding barcoding. So maybe you don't want to have your operator touching the screen. So now apply the barcode onto the part, scan it, whether that's being printed or a label, scan it, and we're moving everything automatically. So inside of this, we'll have an export file that's got the length, the width, the coat profile, the stick profile, and the piece count. As you can see in the image down below, we've got 90 pieces to do and 40 of them are completed. So now I have a way to track my productivity. Everything's tracked via a unique ID number. And I'm able to easily load this up via a USB port. So no complicated wiring or, or data cables required. Simple, easy, effective. So now let's talk about some of the benefits. What are some of the gains that we're getting? Well, first of all, I can S4S all of my parts. So now I don't have to worry about defecting a molded profile. I'll take S4S, defect it, alter the knots down, bow down, whatever that is, that recipe for you and your, your team, you and your product. But I don't have to worry about cutting out defects due to the molder already profiling. Also, because I'm sizing on the tenoner, I don't have to have a perfectly accurate crosscut saw. I don't have to have an operator that's going to get it perfectly cut. I can focus more on the defecting. Lastly, or not lastly, but additionally, is part squareness and accuracy. So if I've got a square part, I've got an accurate part, both my styles and my rails. My clamp is square. I have a square door. I don't have to worry about additional machinery to create a square product overcoming issues somewhere else. This also helps reduce rework. I'm going to do it right the first time. Now also, because of these small parts, I can do that little tiny drawer head that nobody really wants to because they like to keep all their fingers. So just a quick recap, inventory. Maybe this looks like one of your guys' shops. I know it kind of looks like mine was. We have molded profiles everywhere. Changing dimension was a struggle. Accuracy, getting the right part length cut. And like I said earlier, even the most accurate high-speed saws with clamping and all kinds of stuff, most tolerances aren't going to be much better than 15, maybe 10 thousandths if you're running it slow. That still creates that gap. I still have to do that. And if I don't have my part, if I'm referencing the end and not sizing, I can create more issues, such as a stop method versus the pusher like or, or the, the fence like we're using on the Vertongen. And like we talked about, small parts, let's face it, small parts are a nightmare. They fly around, your fingers are close to the saw blade, your fingers are close to the cutter heads. Now we can do this safely. And then we're overcoming our joint issue. I've got square parts going into properly machined parts, I don't have to worry about spending all this time in the paint shop, puttying my joints. I can easily just keep on producing. I can also do MDF. MDF is becoming a really big thing these days. A lot of guys are using routers to do this. But with that, you still have a radius tool. You don't have the look of a five-piece cope and stick door. Now we can do it with MDF. No. We've also got the capability of nine tools on a profile. And then lastly, something we didn't talk too much about is the tool diameter. So traditionally, most tooling on a shaper or, or some type of a, a, a profiling device, they're 125 millimeters. On the Vertongen, we recommend 200, 220, maybe even up to 240. That creates an increased speed, rim speed, which means my finish cut is much better. I also have a shallower mill mark, which means it's easier to sand and less visible to the staining process and the painting process. So this creates a whole 
significantly improve quality of cut. So last but not least is let's talk about batch size one. I can produce one door and then another door and then another door and they can all be different sizes, different profiles. How much does that help you? How much is that a savings when I've got a job that's got to go out, the door got dropped in final assembly. Either process previously, shapers, molders, I'm going to take 30, 40 minutes to get set back up on that profile unless I just happen to be set up on it already. And how many times does that really happen? So now we're talking 30 seconds on a tenoner, 15 seconds to change. I can do a door in a minute to a minute and a half easily. Batch size one. So with that, I'd like to return to Christina and let's talk about some questions.